Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall defend your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we begin our study of God's Word this evening, we'll have a few moments of silent prayer to give you the opportunity to make sure you are in fellowship and right relationship with God the Holy Spirit, to use 1 John 1, 9 if necessary, and then I'm going to open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for the privilege that we have to meet together as a body of believers in freedom in this nation. We thank you for those who have gone before who have uh, made the ultimate sacrifice in order to secure these liberties. And Father, we live in a day today when few people in this nation recognize what we have. They have forgotten and are not aware of what we've lost, and we see freedom erode continuously. This is because this is a nation that has, for the most part, turned their back upon you, and the only true freedom lies in an understanding of the principles of your word. So, Father, we pray for our nation. We pray that there will be men who will faithfully teach the word, that there will be those who will respond, and that the believers in this nation will have an impact on the direction, the thinking of this generation. Now, Father, as we study your word today, we pray that we might respond to the challenge that's embedded here in these verses of Hebrews 2, that we might not take these lightly, treat it as an academic discipline or exercise, but realize that these exhortations, these challenges are directed at us. Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit would drive these principles home in our own lives. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews 2. Now, One of the things that I want to do, and try to continuously do, is to give introductions and reviews that keep us in the overall flow of what's going on in a book like Hebrews. It's so easy to get involved in a study of the Word where you just go verse by verse and phrase by phrase and word by word, and you lose the the forest for for the trees, and you end up doing microscopic analysis of every leaf, but you forget how the leaf relates to the whole forest to the whole ecosystem and so we need to stop and take a look at what's going on remember Hebrews was originally a sermon at least I think it was you can't be dogmatic on that point because it it, it's often called an epistle but it lacks certain characteristics of an epistle which I pointed out in the introduction and it seems to be a five-point message and each point builds or unravels the principles that are embedded in the previous point. And the first point starts in chapter 1, verse 5, and extends down through 2, verse 4. And then we go into the second major point. And each point, as I said, expands, develops principles, doctrines that are laid down in the previous point. And as the writer develops this exhortation, and that's what it is, which is a challenge on the principles of doctrine, What he does is he lays out a case in a certain number of verses, and then he follows that case by an applicational challenge or exhortation that is really directed to each individual and embedded within these these challenges, these exhortations, are warnings. Because apparently the readers to whom this was sent were believers who were on the verge of just throwing in the towel, giving up their Christianity, and going back into into Judaism. And so the writer lays this case and begins with an emphasis on the superiority of Christ, which is what we saw in the first chapter. The emphasis is on what happened at the ascension of Christ, 
when Jesus Christ is elevated above the angels, the principalities and powers, and he is seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. And during the session, he is waiting for God the Father to give him the kingdom. And so this idea of the kingdom is integral to understand where the writer is going as he moves through his points to the, his readers. He is, has this whole concept of the kingdom in the background. Remember, at the first advent, Jesus was preceded by John the Baptist. And his message was, repent, because the kingdom of heaven is near. When Jesus showed up, he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. When he sent out the disciples to the house of Israel, he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. So this was the major emphasis in the first part of Jesus' ministry until the leaders of Israel rejected it. Now, the Jews, that Jewish Christians that the author of Hebrews is directing his challenge to, would be familiar with all of this concept related to the kingdom. And the kingdom is not something that's even present today. It's not the mystical, spiritual kingdom that amillennial uh, allegorical interpretation has developed. It's not a already not yet view of the kingdom, which is what is taught now in so many places, uh, especially at Dallas Seminary and others, that uh, we're already in some form of the kingdom, but we're not in it fully. That's what they mean by already not yet. It's, a, it's an application of Hegelian dialectic, see that's just pure human viewpoint philosophy, to the whole concept of interpretation. And it just shows how constantly and through decade after decade, the evangelical church is influenced by the thought forms of the world system around us. But their idea of the kingdom was a millennial kingdom, a one, literal 1,000 year rule and reign where the son of David, the God-man, would rule on the throne of David in Jerusalem. It would be a Jewish-centered kingdom. And that's the mentality. Now, the reason I'm going back and reviewing that is because we hit a very special word in the last verse of chapter 1 that is repeated in, chap in verse 3 of chapter 2, and that's the word salvation. It's the last word in your English text in verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? And often I tell you, that when you are reading through Scripture, you're trying to understand a passage, there are certain key words, certain key phrases that you have to keep your eye on because they are the interpretive key to understanding what's really being said here. And if you miss your interpretation of that verse, then you're really going to be off-center in terms of understanding the passage and even in terms of application. So... Keep that in mind, in review, that these are people who understand there is a future kingdom. That's why we go through, and that that kingdom is Jewish in nature. And this is why you have such an emphasis in the book of Hebrews on inheritance, on the current session of Jesus, because when it ends, what's going to happen? He's going to return as the victorious son of man who destroys the kingdoms of man on the earth at the end of the tribulation period. And then he inaugurates his kingdom. Then he establishes his millennial rule. Then we will have peace on earth, and it won't be until that particular time. So we've gone through the first chapter, the, from verses 5 to 14. We have a development of the idea that Jesus Christ is over the angels. He is in his deity. He is especially in his humanity. And in his humanity, he is going to he is in authority over the angels, and he will rule over the angels. And this is all, and everything that's happening in human history today is in preparation for that time when he returns and establishes his kingdom. Verse 8 is a quote from Psalm 45, 6 and 7. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of your kingdom. And that kingdom is characterized by the fact that you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. And therefore God, your God, has anointed you or appointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Your companions is a reference to those who will be ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ. Okay, now that ought to get your attention back to, to where we are in understanding uh, this passage. Verses 5 to 14 then establish the foundations. And notice again, 
I'd just like to point these things out, how this writer does it. This, remember, was probably a sermon. Now, if you were to sit down and read it out loud and give it proper inflection and not just read it rapidly to see how fast you could go through, I would think that all 13 chapters would probably take you close to an hour. So this gives you some idea of the kind of teaching they had in the early church. It wasn't a 20-minute sermonette for Christianettes. It wasn't a self-help diagnosis. It wasn't something that was designed to make you feel good. In fact, first time they heard this, their, their brains were probably turning inside out, just like yours does on occasion, thinking, wow, I, I, I've got to get this written down. Now, they couldn't get the tape. They had to get it written down so that they could go back and look at it. And the other thing I want you to note is how it exemplifies basically what we do. In, ch- in b- chapter 1, you see the writer quoting from six different Old Testament passages. In effect, what he's doing is he's done the exegesis and he's developing principles and extracting uh, principles and doctrine from each of those six passages, and then he's building a case for an application. And then as soon as he goes through that cycle once, he comes back and he takes a couple of key ideas that were in that first development, and he starts to expand that. And what does he do? He goes back to different verses in the Old Testament, and he unpacks those verses to show what they are, uh, what they mean, and what they imply in terms of the present age and the present ministry of Christ. And then he builds to another level and ends with a longer exhortation, which contains within it a warning that if you don't pay attention to this, there are serious consequences for now and for eternity. And then he takes some of the ideas in that development and builds in that on the third point and so on all the way through this development. It's very much like what we should have in the church today, but we don't have because people don't want Bible teaching anymore. They want to come and be entertained. The church has become an entertainment center. It is no longer a place where you come to study the Word of God, to be challenged in our own lives as to the the fact that we're still totally depraved. We have a sin nature. We can commit any sin that an unbeliever can, and we can destroy our lives quicker than any unbeliever can destroy their life if we don't pay attention to the Word of God. And there are long-range consequences. It's great that we're saved. We're forgiven. We just... Have, say, have 1 John 1, 9, confess our sins, and we're back in fellowship, and we're ready to go, and then we're sinning again, and you know, too many people just bounce in and out. The principle is stay in fellowship, abide in Christ, walk by the Spirit, and move forward, advance to maturity, because there is a future responsibility that you're being trained for right now. So that's the background. And so he comes to a point where he says, for this reason, in verse 1, not therefore, therefore implies a conclusion, for this reason implies something more specific, because of what was just said, literally, because of this, because of what was just said in these six passages and the principles that were made, he says, give the more earnest or give the highest attention. We studied this last time, give the highest attention attention possible to the things that we have heard. Now, what are the things that we have heard? This is the doctrine that has been taught by, from the pulpit consistently since Jesus Christ ascended to heaven and the church was founded on the day of Pentecost. When you go back and you look at the messages that we do have in the scriptures, we see that they were, they were developing doctrine, teaching. Doctrine's not a bad word. It's not some sort of abstract, irrelevant theology. It's not what has been labeled as dogma or technical doctrinal statements that, that read like some sort of legal document. It is teaching the whole warp and woof of biblical teaching that addresses every area of life, every area of thought, from family life to marriage to raising your children to education to law, politics, philosophy. There is no arena of life or thought or intellectual activity that is not addressed by the Word of God. And yet the sad thing is, in most pulpits around the world, what we find is is pastors who refuse to mine the Word of God. All they do is they get out there with a, with, a, with a gold pan and they wash around a little little dust and see what they can come up with. 
And usually it ends up being salvation over and over and over again. And if they get beyond salvation, what they try to do is just tell people how to live a moral life, and they never teach spiritual mechanics and how to walk by means of the Spirit and how to recover from sin. They don't teach grace orientation, doctrinal orientation, or how to love God, which is the foundation for being able to love one another. All this is just, just left out. And that, so it's a very shallow superficial, truncated form of Christianity. Or they decide they're going to imitate some popular preacher today who's building some megachurch, and in order to attract more people, they're going to imitate that individual. Let me tell you what you're going to see in the next 10 years. Right here in this city, we have the largest church now in the country, they say. And you're going to find everybody from the Methodist to the Episcopals to the Bible churches trying to imitate what they do in order to get more people. Wow, he's discovered the formula. Let's all get on board and ride that wagon train with him. And we won't compromise too much, but they already have because they're looking at method as the way to attract people. And the issue is God provides the hearers. And when we live in an era today, it's terribly difficult as a pastor. You want to reach people. You want to teach large numbers of people, not because of an ego thing, but simply because large numbers of people need to hear the Word of God. But they won't come. They don't want to come. And so it's frustrating for a lot of pastors, so they often will subtly compromise in different areas just to try to get more people. And, um, you know, when I was a young pastor, I fell in that trap just like everybody else does. But you just have to recognize that it's better to have 50 people who are devoted to the Word of God than 500 where only 50 are devoted to the Word of God because those other 450 people are just going to be trouble and they are going to mess up the other 50. So the focus is on paying attention, giving the highest form of attention to the things we have heard. That is the propositional content of biblical revelation from Genesis to Revelation. All Scripture is God-breathed. Every, even those those horrible, boring little genealogies and all the records in, in, uh, in Chronicles. But they're all important for various, various reasons, and they all feed towards our understanding of what God is doing in history. So we need to give the most attention, the highest attention, to the things we have heard, lest we are cast adrift, lest our anchor is slipped, and we just gradually, slowly see our stern drift out into the current and then taken away from the dock. And the next thing you do, you wake up and you go, scratch your head and wonder, what happened? I used to be happy. There used to be stability in my life. My marriage used to have a, a vitality that it doesn't have anymore. And let me tell you, nothing can screw up a marriage quicker than one partner who gets away from the Lord. I mean, we heard this last week when uh, Gene Brown was here talking about evangelism, that the hardest evangelism he had uh, experience was with his own parents. And he talked about how, how his parents had had 60 years of a wonderful marriage. And then his mother finally responded to the gospel. And everything just turned upside down in, their, in his parents' marriage after that because his father never did trust the Lord. But once you had a believer and an unbeliever, you know, they're operating on completely different frames of reference, and it just creates a problem. So the key is to stay steadfast to the Word. And then in verse 2, we come to the next development. And that begins with the first word, for. Now, I would suggest that probably, I don't know the exact statistic, but I would guess that about 90% of the time, when you see the word for at the beginning of a verse in the New Testament, it's going to be this Greek word gar. And gar indicates that the writer is, going, is explaining or expanding the previous statement. He's going to develop a, a, the idea there. So he drew a conclusion in verse 1, because of this, because of what I just said, we have to give the highest attention. That's the main idea of the first verse. The highest attention to the Word of God, to doctrine. For, because in light of this, he expands it, and he wants us to understand what the implications are for making doctrine the highest priority in your life. And he begins with the word for, and then he follows that with a conditional word, if. If is, in the Greek, a first-class condition. 
Now, Greek has a little more flexibility in this than English does. In English, if you want to express a condition, which is the word if, which can imply maybe it is, maybe it isn't, we don't really know what's going to happen, if it rains tomorrow, and I don't know if it will, it indicates a certain amount of contingency and uncertainty. But we use the word if in a broad range of nuances. If sometimes almost has the idea of sense. And uh, we could say that uh, uh, if school started today, I need to pay attention to school zones. Well, that's if and it's true. In a lot of places, school, some schools opened yesterday, some opened today, and we almost have the idea since school opened, I need to pay attention to these uh, school zone speed limits again. That's the idea we have here in the first class condition. It's not emphasizing contingency. It's not emphasizing the idea that maybe it was spoken through angels, maybe it wasn't. It's the idea of certainty if and it was. So it's a first class condition which assumes the truth of that first clause, the if clause, which in technical grammatical terms is called the protasis. If the word spoken through angels proved steadfast and it was. And then we come to the third word, which is a key concept here. We keep getting these synonyms. Notice we had the things that we uh, have heard in verse 1, and now we have what we heard. That is the word. You hear something. You hear a message. You hear a word. Something uh, vibrates the eardrum. Something is written on the page that you read. And that's what is referred to here by the Greek word logos, which can be translated word or message or content, or thoughts. It has a wide range of meanings. In fact, in the uh, classical dictionaries, there's probably 15 or 20 different nuances. Logos is the root, uh, root Greek word from which we get the English word logic, which means uh, the study of, of how rational propositions are put together to move from one premise to, a, to another premise and to reach conclusions. It also is that the basis for the last um, couple of syllables in words like biology and zoology. It's the study of something, the science of something, knowledge about something. So that word logos has a wide range of meaning. But here it has the idea of a word or a message. And I think that in light of uh, the context, we need to take, think of it in terms of the message, the revelatory message given through the angels in the Old Testament. Now, while you hold your place here, if you just flip back to Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, I want to point out a parallel. In Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, we're told that after God spoke at various times and in a variety of ways in times past to the fathers by means of the prophets. Notice, in verse 1 of chapter 1, God spoke by means of the prophets. No mention of angels. And then when we come to Hebrews 1-2, again we're talking about Old Testament revelation, that's the parallel, but now he, instead of talking about the prophets who were the human instruments, he informs us that there's another intermediate agency involved in revelation, and that was angels. And he says that if this message of divine revelation was spoken through the angels and it's dia plus the genitive indicating intermediate agency. This is a message communicated through the angels and that word for translated spoken is the Greek word laleo which is the same word we saw back in Hebrews 1 1 and 1 2 talking about God speaking after God uh, spoke in times past in these latter days he has spoken to us by his son so there's a direct connection the application the writer is deriving in verse 2 of chapter 2 is an outgrowth of what he has said in chapter 1 so you see the the logical flow and development of his thought and he goes right back to those previous foundations in chapter 1 to build his application for if the message spoken through the angels and this is an articular aorist which indicates that it is a specific word and it emphasizes our specific uh, revelatory activity that is referred to back in the Old Testament. Now 
Think about it a minute. Go back to Exodus 19, Exodus 20, when the Israelites are encamped at the base of Mount Sinai. And God begins to speak to them and they hear the voice of God. And if you'd been there with your uh, digital recorder, you could have recorded the voice of God. And if you'd had a, a um, uh, video camera, you could have videoed the lightning and the flashes and everything on the mountain. Because this was not something that they were imagining, which is what liberal Protestant theology argues, is that these were religious experiences. They don't have objective reality. But the fact is the Bible presents them as being objectively real. God spoke. They heard it. Every one of them. And they were scared to death. And you go into chapter 20, where, and chapter 19 and 20, where the Ten Commandments are given in the foundation of the law. And you can search in vain for any reference to angels. Never mentioned in Exodus. But they were there. And it's indicated in other passages. For example, in Deuteronomy 33, verse 2 which is at the end of Moses' final sermon to the Israelites, just before he died, he says, The Lord came from Sinai and dawned on them from Mount Seir, and he shone forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints. That's the New King James. Literally in the Hebrew it says the Kadashim, the Holy Ones. And this is a term related to angels. In fact, that's how the Septuagint understands this. That he came with 10,000 of his angels when he was on Sinai. And from his right hand came a fiery law for them. That is for the Jews. So Deuteronomy 33.2, Moses indicates that, the, that, that there was a, a host, an army of angels that accompanied God when he came to reveal the law to Moses. This is indicated again. In Acts 7, 38, uh, where Stephen is speaking to the Jews, and he says, This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him, that is to Moses on Mount Sinai, and with our fathers. Notice a similar terminology to what we have in Hebrews 1, 1. And then Acts 7, 53, that they had received the law by what? By the direction of angels and have not kept it. So it was clearly understood that angels were involved as part of the intermediate agency of revealing the Mosaic Law. Galatians 3.19 is another passage. This is where Paul says, what purpose then does the law serve? It was added, in this case it's the Mosaic Law, it was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was appointed or ordained through angels by the hand of a mediator. And the mediator would have been Moses. So you see that God is the ultimate source of the giving of revelation to Mosaic law. The first intermediate agent was through angels. The second was a human intermediary who was Moses. And then it's given to the people. And this shows that the angels are, what are they? They're serving as covenant witnesses. They're court witnesses. Just, this is the same concept we see in, in Revelation 2 and 3 when we talk about why those epistles are written to the angels of the churches. It's that same kind of function. The angels are serving as covenant witnesses. Just like if you go down to, to a, um, a notary public and you need to have something signed and, wit- and you have to have witnesses there because you're signing a legal document. This is the same issue. The angels are serving as witnesses. Why? Because all of human history is teaching things about the angelic conflict. And it's teaching things to the angels about God's character and about why Satan or any other creature cannot live independently of God without destroying everything. So the angels are present and they're part of the process. Okay, back to Hebrews 2.2. For if the message, that is the revelatory message of the Old Testament, if the message which was communicated or spoken through the angels, through the intermediary agency of the angels, proved steadfast. Now that's an awkward way of translating this. The word proved is a translation of the Greek verb genomai, which means to uh, come into existence, to come, to become. So it should be understood in this way. For if the message spoken through the angels 
came into existence or came to be confirmed. It indicates a process of moving from non-existence to existence, from non-confirmation to confirmation. And that's that word steadfast is the Greek word babaios, which means something that is fixed or certain or unalterable, immovable, or absolutely stable. So it indicates that the Mosaic law is perfectly stable. Paul said it was holy and righteous. You can't come along and say because the Pharisees misinterpreted the law that there was something wrong with the law. There was nothing wrong with the law. It was an absolutely perfect government document. It shows what real freedom is. Freedom isn't some... You get too many people today who come along and start talking about freedom and liberty and they go where? They go to John Locke, they go to uh, Montesquieu, they go to some enlightenment political philosopher to derive their definition of freedom and liberty. Look, you don't start with some human viewpoint philosopher to figure out what freedom is. Freedom starts with the Word of God. They had perfect freedom in the Mosaic Law, but it was a kind of freedom that wouldn't have been recognized as freedom by John Locke. Why? Because his starting point is an absolute autonomous revolution, uh, revelation. His starting point was human reason and, and human experience. He was an empiricist, and that's his starting point. So you always have to be careful. Sure, he came up with many great, wonderful insights on the nature of freedom and liberty and the relationship of government, the, the governed the governing to the governed, but his starting point is flawed, and to the degree his starting point is different from the Word, there are going to be flaws in his conclusions. So when we are going to talk about such elevated concepts as freedom and liberty, you start with the Word of God. You don't start with some autonomous philosophical concept and then try to read that into the Bible. You start with the Bible and let it define everything. So, we see this process that the law is given, and then over time, its certainty is established. That doesn't mean it wasn't certain to begin with. It's what we're going to see in the next section, is that there, was, there, there were promises of blessing and discipline in the Mosaic Law. And as time went by and the Israelites obeyed, the law was confirmed through its, the blessing that they received. If they disobeyed God and God disciplined them, then the law is confirmed by God's in action of that discipline. So it's demonstrated to be true in history. It is true in reality, but in time it was demonstrated through the, uh, what, what is explained in the next clause. And the writer of Hebrews says, For if the word spoken through the angels was confirmed, and it was. And I want you to notice one more thing about that word steadfast. That's the word babayas. It's used again, if you look down to verse 3, it's used again in verse 3 where it says confirmed. Uh, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was what? Confirmed. So what you ought to do in your Bible, if you like to mark in your Bible, you ought to circle that word steadfast or whatever it is in your translation in verse 2 and then circle the word confirmed and connect them because, and I don't know why translators do this, why they choose different English words to translate the same Greek word in the same context because you lose something the writer's trying to connect together by using the same word. Okay, he goes on to say that for if the word spoken was confirmed, and it was, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. Notice he's not, (coughs) excuse me, he's not focusing on the blessing they received for obedience. He's focusing on the fact that disobedience brings discipline. Because that's the issue he's dealing with in the life of his readers, is they're threatening to just chunk their Christianity and go back to the, to the old legalism of the Mosaic Law. They're threatening to just say, you know, the pressure's too great, the difficulties are too intense, I'm tired of putting up, I'm just going to go back, and things were more comfortable when I was operating on all the ritual of the Mosaic Law, and, uh, and that's probably true. You know, as soon as you want to get into the boiler 
boiler point, boiling point of the angelic conflict, just start getting serious about doctrine. Let me tell you, the, in, the heat's going to turn up, the intensity is going to crank, and you're going to think that you're making some real mistakes in life because everything's going to start getting a little bit, a little bit wacko. Because all of a sudden, Satan and the demons and everybody's going to come along and, and try to distract you from being a growing, maturing believer. And the angelic conflict is just going to go nuts around you. And you'll think you're living at the very vortex of, of the angelic conflict. And you probably are for a while. Until, and it's just a test to see if you're going to be faithful in a decision to follow the Lord and consistently put His Word first. And that's the warning here. So it's focusing on the negative. Now, that's not popular today. I keep hearing people say, you know, if you're going to attract people, you never say anything negative, and you don't talk about sin. Well, that's the last thing you want to do is talk about sin. Unfortunately, the Bible talks about sin, so we have to stick with the Word of God. He knows what's best. Every transgression, and this is the word parabasis in the Greek, which means to violate the law. That It's not specifically... Uh, here it's talking about the Mosaic Law because that's the context, but it can also refer to just the general standards of God. But here it's talking about the violation of the Mosaic Law because that's what was revealed through the angels. For every transgression, it's just another synonym for sin, and disobedience receives a just reward. And the word for reward is the word parakoe, or excuse me, this, somehow this slide got confusing. This is actually parkoe is the word for, for disobedience, which means to hear wrongly, to not to uh, apply what you hear, not to, to be disobedient because of careless or inattentive hearing. So parabasis emphasizes the violation of the standard, and disobedience indicates careless listening. You're not paying attention to what you heard. You're not giving due diligence to the message of the angels. And as a result, it receives a just recompense. And so we have a corrected translation. This is in the yellow on the screen overhead. For if the message spoken through the intermediate agency of angels became unalterable, and it did, and every violation and careless infraction received just recompense, then, here's our conclusion. What the writer is saying is, look, number one, the message was proved unalterable. It came through the angels. Point number two, every violation and infraction received recompense. Then, in light of that, in light of the fact that God's justice will be enacted if you treat His Word lightly, that should call upon you for a certain kind of behavior. And this is verses 3 and 4. And this is the center of this section. Actually, in the Greek, verses 2, 3, and 4 are one sentence. Now, some of your English translations break that up in order to make it read a little easier in the English. But when you do that, you lose the thrust of these verses. Verse 2 establishes a foundation for the thought. Verse 4 indicates uh, additional information. But the main idea is what's communicated in this opening rhetorical question. How shall we escape if we neglect this great salvation? Look at what happened in the Old Testament. And they had a lesser form of, of revelation. What did, what did the writer say in verse 1? He said it was uh, in various forms, in various ways, but it was incomplete. But now it's complete. Now it's through his son. In the past, and he's going to develop this later on in the book, in the past it was through, through Moses and the prophets, but it's now it's through Jesus Christ and the apostles. We have more revelation. We have a more certain revelation. We've seen the ultimate revelation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if they had a lesser form of, it, uh, of revelation in the Old Testament, and if they didn't have everything that we have given to us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, and if they suffered these serious consequences in the Old Testament, because they treated the word lightly, what do you think is going to happen to you if you treat it lightly? It's a powerful argument, a powerful warning that lays the foundation for the subsequent warning sections coming up in Hebrews. 
And this is addressed to believers because if you note, he says, how shall we escape? In, in chapter 2, verse 1, he said, therefore we, he includes himself. He's talking about believers. Just as an aside, this is one of the great interpretive problems in the New Testament. Is the writer of Hebrews addressing unbelievers or believers in these passages? Can believers really fall away and reject Christ and turn their back on Christ? Sure they can. That's called grace. But we're in the midst of a big theological controversy today and have been for probably half a century or more called Lordship Salvation. At least that's the modern permutation of it. Uh, it's, the one side's called the free grace gospel, and that's where we are if you don't know. The other side's called Lordship Salvation, and it's not simply the idea that you have to accept Jesus as Lord to be saved, although I've certainly heard some of their proponents say that. When you get right down to it, what Lordship Salvation is saying is this, that if you are truly, watch the adverbs, if you are truly and genuinely saved, if you have had true, genuine, saving faith, then that is going to be exhibited by a change in your life. And if you can't look back from the time that you were saved and identify certain fruit, that's why we call them you know, fruit judgers, uh, if, if fruit pickers, if you can't look back and evaluate this fruit, then maybe you weren't saved. Maybe you just had a false confession, they'll say. Maybe you just had a profession of faith and you didn't really believe. Well, that's just hogwash. And, the, and I don't have, want to go down the rabbit trail to look at all that right now, but the documentation they go to just doesn't work. There are no passages to teach that. You never have the Bible talk about true faith, genuine faith, real faith. Uh, you just have faith in Christ over and over and over again in the Gospel of John. It's faith in Christ. And this is the battle today, is over the purity of the gospel, that Jesus Christ paid the penalty for our sins, and the only thing you need to do to appropriate that for yourself is to believe that he did it. And after you trust Christ as Savior, the regeneration doesn't ameliorate or dilute or reduce the power of your sin nature. You're still a lousy, rotten sinner with those same trends that you were before you were saved. And these folks just have a problem with post-salvation sin, so that when somebody comes along and says, well, you know, I was, had a profession of faith when I was 10 years old, but now I'm smart, and I've been to college, and I've got an education, and I just can't believe the Bible anymore. I just can't believe it's the Word of God, and I can't believe in, in, in Jesus Christ or a sacrifice. That's just such, a, such an antiquated idea. I just can't go there anymore. They'll say, well, I guess you weren't saved. And that's not what the Bible teaches at all. The Bible teaches once saved, always saved. You, can, you, you may fall from grace. You may, as we see in this passage, you may slip your anchor and drift away, but you're still saved. And this is the gospel of grace. And this is one of the centerpiece verses in the whole debate. For if, uh, how shall we escape... If we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord. Now, context, when's first there? Is that Genesis? No. It's when Jesus first began to teach in the, in the uh, incarnation. What was he teaching? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us, that is, the apostles and their associates, the writer's was probably an associate and not an apostle, confirmed to us by those who heard him. See, he had not direct, whoever wrote this did not directly hear the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in verse 4, God also bearing witness, there's that legal term of confirmatory evidence again, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit. You have three classifications of confirmation here indicating that what was taught by the Lord Jesus Christ and his apostles is from God, is the truth. So the question is, how shall we escape? You think you're going to get away with something? You think you're going to be able to rationalize sin? See, this is a problem with sin is it flows out of arrogance, and arrogance is always blinding. 
It, we blind ourselves. We think, oh, God's not going to come down on me. I'll just confess it later. Or, you know, no, nobody's going to know. Or I'm just going to indulge this in my own mind for a while. And I'm just going to enjoy thinking about uh, vengeance on that person or what would happen to them. And if God really executed his judgment on that person, like, I mean, we're just going to give ourselves over for a little while to that to, uh, bitterness and anger and resentment. But this hurts our soul, and we don't realize that eventually God's going to deal with those things. Just because he hasn't yet doesn't mean he won't. Okay, verse 3. How shall we escape? This is the Greek word from ek fugo, meaning to flee plus the preposition ek for out of, to flee away from or to escape. Now what's interesting here is the grammar. It's a future middle voice. So it, it's talking about how shall we escape in the future, but the middle voice is a dynamic middle which is given for emphasis. And the emphasis is on the volition of the subject. It pulls it right back to the, what, the action of the subject and that the subject must make, make a decision. The we, you and me, need to make decisions with regard to this. Uh, and and th instead of thinking that we're going to escape and get away with it. How shall we escape if we uh, neglect such a great salvation? How shall we escape? Now, before we go on, I want to go back a minute and build a little case. How did the Jews escape? Did they escape? Let's go back. I want you to turn back in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 26. Now the writers, the writer of Hebrews wants his readers to pay attention to what happened to the Jews in the Old Testament. That's why he brought in this issue of the Mosaic Law. And the Mosaic Law contained within it certain promises related to blessing as well as discipline. Blessing for obedience and discipline for disobedience. Now did the Jews escape? because they treated God's law lightly, because they didn't pay attention to it, because they tried to just sort of compromise with the false religions of the Canaanites? Well, let's look. Leviticus 26. There's promises given for ble uh, promises of blessing in verses 5 to 13. And in those verses we see that there is promise of rain and agricultural productivity, and that there will be secure borders in verses uh, 3 through 5. You'll dwell in your land safely. That's the last phrase in verse 5. And then in verse 6, it picks up on that idea and says that you, God will give peace in the land, that there won't be invasion, that even though Israel's sitting there across all the trade routes in the ancient world and everybody is vying and fighting for control, that God would give them peace if they were obedient. He would also eliminate predatory animals. Now think about that. He's going to eliminate predatory animals. Now, what does the presence of predatory animals have to do with their spiritual condition? See, this is where you, if you're a believer, you have to come, come to, to doctrine to understand that there is ultimately, under God's control, a cause-effect relationship between the physical domain and the spiritual domain. Now, you'll never figure that out through science or through empiricism. You can't figure it out through studying history, but you can learn it by looking at what God says. This is one reason why after Adam's sin, you have a consequence of sin that changes the digestive structure of all the animals. They went from being grass eaters to and some became carnivores. Uh, there's a change in the womb of the, of the woman so that now there's going to be different dynamics at work in the birth process and there's going to be pain and difficulty. Spiritual decisions affect physical realities. And so God says, if you're obedient to me, the predatory animals, the harmful animals are going to disappear. Why? Well, God's going to affect that. There's not going to be military invasion. If you're obedient, God in his control of history is going to prevent these power blocks in the ancient world from invading. Furthermore, in verse 7, God says that, in fact, you'll be blessed with military victories. You won't have much. You may have only five, but they'll put to flight 500. You may have 100, and they'll put to flight 1,000. 
I will give you military victory. It's not going to be dependent on your understanding of Sun Tzu. It's not going to be dependent on your understanding of von Clausewitz. It's not going to be dependent upon uh, your technology. It's going to be dependent upon your spirituality. Now, isn't that interesting? If you just walk in obedience to the Mosaic law, you will have tremendous victory over your enemies. Why? Because God is in control of history. So the spiritual realities are more real than the physical realities. And then they will enjoy an intimate fellowship with God, pictured as God walking among them in verses 11 to 13. But see, the Jews never really obeyed the law, and they never experienced that. What they experienced was the five stages of divine discipline given in the next few verses. In verses 16 and 17, we have the first stage of divine discipline. And they were, would experience terror from their enemies, an internal anxiety. Everybody's going to have neuroses and psychoses and have to run off and hire a psychotherapist in order to handle life. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? They're going to have health problems. How many times do we hear of diseases and health problems today that we never heard of before? Similar, kind of par- similar parallel. Disease would increase. Enemies would profit from your work. You're not going to reap the benefits from your productivity, but your enemies will. Stage two of the discipline is given in verses 18 to 20. They would experience a drought. The sun would be like brass and the earth like, uh, or the sun like iron, the earth like bronze. Uh, They would have a famine as a result of the drought. Uh, Drought. There would be an economic recession as a result of that. And there would be agricultural disasters. And they would spend all of their time and energy just trying to eke out a living from the land, verse 20. Then we get the third stage in verse 26, uh, in chapter 26, verses 21 to 22. Notice, remember I said there was a ble- in the, if they were obedient, the predatory animals would, would disappear? Now they're going to increase. Isn't it interesting how the folks up in Montana, the environmentalists want to reintroduce the red wolf and they're having these battles with the uh, cattle ranchers and the farmers up there and what our environmentalists today want to do is reintroduce predatory animals I remember when we were living up in Connecticut there was a guy uh, who lived just a couple of miles from us over in North Stonington and he went out in his backyard and there's a black bear up on top of the rabbit hutch now there had rabbit hutch there haven't been black bear in that area in a long time, but the environmentalists want to reintroduce them back in these these predatory animals. See, everything gets topsy-turvy when you get away from the Word of God. Stage four, in verses 23 to 26, they would experience military invasion and dominance by foreign powers. They would no longer be a sovereign nation, but they would be uh, under the control of foreign powers, even if they weren't completely defeated. There would be another increase of disease and plagues and uh, move from economic recession to economic depression in that cycle. And then you come to the fifth cycle, which is the worst stage, where they would be occupied by a foreign military power. They would come under siege. As a result of the siege, they would engage in cannibalism in verses 27 uh, to 39. You shall, in verse 29, it says, You shall eat the flesh of your sons, and you shall eat the flesh of your daughters. This is exactly what happened both in 586 B.C. when the uh, Babylonians were attacking and destroyed Jerusalem and again when the Romans did in AD 70. There would be economic collapse. God would come in and destroy the idols and the temples that they had set up. He would destroy their cities. And the people would then be removed from the land God had promised them and they would be scattered throughout all the nations. And those left in the land would be weak They would be despairing, they would lose hope, and God would not listen to their prayers. We're going to see that in Deuteronomy 32. Actually, what I think I'm going to do, since we set the stage so well, let's just go back and look at our verse for a minute. I don't want to lose this train of thought. I've kind of built up the intensity of the cursings. I want to come back and finish that next time. But I want you to come go go back to this Hebrews 2 verse. Two. Let me find the slide. For if the word spoken, that is the Mosaic law, communicated through the angels, proved steadfast, and God fulfilled these curses, 
and every transgression and disobedience received its proper recompense, how are you going to escape if you neglect that same salvation? That's the th- this is a powerful warning. God is just bringing us up short to get us our attention that we can't treat the Bible lightly. And this is a real problem I think we have in our culture today, especially among a, a lot of conservative evangelicals. We're so used to having the Bible and the freedom that we've reached a point where we take it lightly. We take it for granted. We have a cavalier attitude to the fact that we have so much available. Never before in human history has so much Bible, sound Bible teaching. Now there's a lot of garbage out there too, but never before have we had the availability of so much Bible doctrine through the internet, through mp3 recordings, through things that are available on the computer, computer programs, computer study tools. You go down to some of the uh, better Christian bookstores, some of the information that's available today is, is far greater than any other time in human history. Buck Anderson, who's the provost at College of Biblical Studies, and I were having a dinner one night, and over the past uh, 10 years or so, as Buck's worked with the school and worked with lots of pastors in different denominations around uh, the Houston area, he, he looked at me and said, Robbie, do you realize that nobody else has a kind of education that we've got? The education we got at Dallas Seminary back in the 80s and the 70s was probably in the top one one thousandth of a percentile of education available to any professional pastors or scholars in all of the church age. And yet, you know, we have so many guys take it lightly. And he talked about going from church to church and working with different churches and says a lot of these guys out there, they love the Lord and they love the Word. They went to seminary and didn't learn anything. But we have so much, and it's available so little. And I look around, and I see men who have this training, and it's so sad because they don't use it. One reason a lot of men don't use it, and they don't want to teach in very much depth, is because their congregations will leave them. So they're, in a sense, they water it down so that they'll have somebody listen to them. And they go off to, uh, they get involved in all these dog and pony shows and uh, entertainment just so they can have somebody to listen to them. And it is a tremendous judgment on this generation because we are seeing and witnessing the same trends that were going on in the early church with the writer, with these, the, the people who are receiving this letter, that they were treating the Word of God in a light manner, in a cavalier manner, and didn't realize how serious the consequences were if you don't make the Word of God the highest priority in your life. Not just learning it, but applying it consistently on a day-to-day basis. Let's bow our heads and close in prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word and the challenge that's here to put the word first and foremost, to organize our schedules, to organize our lives around your word, that it is only through your word that we are going to learn how to live and experience that abundant life that Jesus Christ promised to those who would abide in him and walk by the Spirit. Father, we pray that you would help us not to forget this, not to treat this lightly, but to be willing to take the challenge to be overcomers, to be companions, to be those who are true disciples, who to press on to spiritual maturity. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.